Okay, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Gemma and I'm the Chief Customer Officer at Dashing Group. For those of you that don't know Dashing, we are a retail marketing partner to many of Australia and New Zealand's brands, helping them to design and execute in-store experiences for their customers. At Dashing, we are obsessed with retail and our guest speaker shares our devotion to improving customer interactions with brands. Howard Saunders spent the majority of his former years designing stores, believing that retail is the engine of our economy, or perhaps more simply put, it's life. So when we talk about retail and hospitality, providing a service and selling a product, we are in fact talking about how we live and how those brands can make our daily engagements with them better and better. If ever there was a moment for change, for growth and for action, the time is now. This year, the world has been turned on its head. But through the devastation of this pandemic, we have witnessed many brands become smarter and through this disruptive time, they have discovered new pathways to their customers and better ways to keep those customers engaged with their brand. Howard provides a unique lens on retail, human behaviors and all the trends that rise out of these everyday activities that consume our lives. After watching Howard at the Retail World Congress in Madrid a few years ago, I was energized and inspired by his passionate storytelling of how we shop, how our reliance on technology has altered our shopping behaviors, how brands are seeking to connect with their customers but often falling short, and now how consumers feel about spending when there is so much distraction with the pandemic, protests and political unrest. Howard will be taking the virtual stage for the next 40 minutes to share his thoughts on the opportunities ahead of us in the next six to 12 months. It's my great pleasure to hand over Howard. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Gemma. My number one fan, clearly I've, I've got one. That's good news. Um, wow, isn't it a strange time we're living in? I'm sitting here, I was just contemplating what my normal life is, you know, was it seems a long while ago, um, prancing around on stage and talking to big audiences. And now I, I should give you a bit of context, really, because I'm, I'm sitting in, a, in my studio, uh, surrounded by soundproofing <laughs> stuff hanging up um, in the dark, because it's, it's 6 a.m. Um, it's cold. Um, I'm about 70 miles from London in the country, so it should be quite quiet. Um, and it's lockdown two here. So I know you have a mixed picture. Out there. I know I'm talking to a pretty much international audience with a big focus on Australia. And I know it's right across the planet. It's a mixed picture and it's a weird picture. Let's be honest, isn't it? Um, so, but thank you for joining me for this funny little soiree. So I've titled my session, um, well, Retail Sheds Its Skin because it's a defining moment, isn't it? It's a defining moment in, in history. And, and Gemma, you're talking about when we met, or uh, where is it, a couple of years ago now. Well, it's a very different world now. And I do believe we've come to this sort of defining line in the sand. And I've called it a meltdown for various, for various reasons, which will become clear. So let me sort of chat it through with you a little bit over the next few minutes. Um, to understand the future and where we're going, these are just my thoughts, by the way, obviously. Um, and I've had plenty of time to think, let's be honest. We've had sort of, certainly in the UK here, sort of seven, eight months in prison, really. So there's plenty of time to, uh, to think and, and to write. And that's what I've been doing. So to understand the future, you have to really understand where you've come from. And so I thought I'd do a little summary of how I see where we were, the way we were, in other words. And, to start on an intellectual note, I don't know how many of you, I'm going to try and sound intelligent, how many of you read Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, because it sort of changed my life, actually. It's a 2018 book, of course, it's a pre-COVID book. And his thesis, crudely, is that we've never had it so good, actually. And it, it doesn't matter on what level, whether it's a, you know, access to education, uh, the reduction in poverty, the connections to family, the way we can communicate, uh, the chances of dying at the hands of another man, or, uh, decreased violence and all everything. This book, chapter by chapter, makes the point that we've never 
had it so good. We had everything. My sort of way of summing that up is, is to say we're Henry VIII. That's why <laughs> I'll take a little sip of water. We've all turned into Henry VIII. And what I mean by that, and this is then, this is pre-COVID, okay? So we all became Henry VIII. Why? Well, because apart from the fact that there's a global obesity crisis, which is one thing, we have access to everything, don't we? You know, I do my thing about we've got enough stuff. And there's no one out there, certainly not in the Western world, in the, in the big meaning of the term Western, um, who hasn't got everything. And I, I know you, I think Gemma posted a clip of me doing my little rant about having enough stuff. And that still holds true, doesn't it? I mean, the fact is there's no one out there listening right now who needs a t-shirt or a pair of sneakers, or, you know, you know that you have trouble putting your jacket back in the wardrobe tonight. And at the bottom of your wardrobe, you're not alone in, in a, seeing a sea of shoes there. I mean, it's not just you, it's everyone. And it isn't just clothes, it's, it's food and it's, the pharmacy, the cabinet in your bathroom, it's overflowing under the sink. Open the cabinet, I'm, I'm, there's too many bottles, too many cleaning fluids and sponges and stuff. We've all got enough stuff. And I think you have to understand that's number one. If you're wanting to sell to customers in this new climate, you have to understand where we are, where we've come from. Well, we've had enough stuff. We are Henry VIII. Um, and we can snap our fingers and have anything, can't we? at any time with also the way we eat this. I mean, I know this is a, a sort of a uniquely English perspective in some ways, because you know, we just live on nothing but um, ready meals, but posh ready meals, you know, ready meals with, with, you know, chicken stuffed with shrimps and God, this is Henry VIII territory. This is really it. I mean, if he could come back now and see us, it'd be hilarious. It's why we're all, doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, we're all eating to that level of sophistication, bacon wrapped chicken and Christ knows what. Incredible really how far we've come. So we've got enough stuff. We're eating like Henry VIII, we're like kings. And we can snap our fingers just like he could and have anything we want, anything we want within the hour or within the day. I mean, that's quite an incredible place to be, isn't it? And you're just trying to understand the world of retail now. And I think anyone from the past would have trouble imagining how we got here, really. So I'd like to preface with that. And then in terms of the big looming problems that we had, the way we were, remember, pre-COVID, we were all being threatened by this thing about robots taking our jobs. And it was quite extraordinary. I have a particular take on it, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, anyone who's read any of my stuff will know that I have a particular angle on it, but they can't stop threatening us. Can they, being whoever it is, the authorities, the, the media, like to threaten us? And they certainly, the McKinsey put his big fat report together in, in 2019 that went to all governments explaining how uh, threatening, really warning of how 800 million jobs would be lost by 2030. That's quite some claim isn't it and I think you put that in perspective now it doesn't look quite so good we'll, we'll come on to that but we're constantly catastrophizing everything actually that's the truth of it constantly looking for the worst in everything so even when things were good we were thinking well we're all going to lose our jobs to robots very shortly um, and I think the peak of human civilization we reached really with TikTok didn't we I know it's very odd sitting here <laughs> <laughs> laughing to myself. I have no audience, you see. Um, no audience. I can't see you. I can't hear you. So I'm just talking to myself in a funny little room, basically, instead. Of... The good thing about that, of course, is that I can, I'm naked from the waist down, which is, you know, it makes me, helps me relax. But no, the peak of human existence became TikTok, isn't it, really? I mean, if you couldn't, if you were trying to sum up the 21st century so far, I mean, TikTok, it's, it's, it's sort of a billion crazed teenagers doing, you know, whatever, shaking their midriffs. And, can I do the dance? I don't know if I can. They, they do that whole thing, don't they? The, I don't know what it is, but you know, they, this, is, this is how, this is where mankind got to. And you have to sort of kind of understand that when you, if you want to get into the mindset of uh, the contemporary consumer. 
So yes, we've gone crazy. And I, uh, this is again, I keep reminding you, Pete, pre-COVID, I talked about the age of hysteria. I mean, it does, just think about it. Things were never so good, Stephen Pinker, Age of Enlightenment. Things have never been so good. You've never had so much food in your belly. You've never had it so easy, uh, you know, lack of wars, increased education, massive reduction in poverty. And yet, look how un unhappy we were, incredible. So we were panicked and hysterical, literally screaming in the streets about Trump, climate change, and Brexit over here, and fake news. And I don't want to read the title, I could write them forever, isn't it? I mean, lack of access to housing and veganism, whatever it is, we were hysterical about it, absolutely hysterical. And this is where we got to, I think, clearly at the end of 2019. And then I like to answer things as well. So I like to just, not just tell you how crazy things go, but try and explain it. And I would say, so I asked the questions, the difficult questions, who is to blame for this? Who or what is to blame for this? And I know you want to say Trump again, don't you? But the truth is, the truth is, it's God. Yes, it's God. And when I say God, I mean this, don't I, said leaning forward. I mean, this little device, the great overlord of data, what I call God, because you have to try and see these things from, from a 30,000 foot view, that's what I tend to do, which, you know, imagine how important that little smartphone is in terms of our Darwinian history. Imagine for 250,000 years, whatever mankind's been, dragged itself up from the swamp and built tall buildings and, and landed on the moon, moon and all the stuff, in, in electricity and everything else. And yet only 10 years ago, this little black slab of glass landed in our palms. Suddenly we had access to everything. Everyone had access to everything, the sum of all human knowledge. Not only did it know everything about you, where you've been, who your friends are, your taste in music and everything else, it could answer anything. You could ask it anything it knew. When you're watching the film, you can just ask him, how tall is that stupid actor? And is he still alive? And who did he make? We're all doing it. We now have the answer to everything. We have God in our pockets. And that clearly goes some other way to explain why we became so hysterical because believe it or not we are giving our children our eight-year-old children whatever limit you put on it a device for which they can by which they can publish their innermost thoughts consider that they can globally publish they can tell the world their innermost ridiculous stupid thoughts and publish them globally. And that's quite some device, isn't it? So that's the world we were living in. And then boom, we switched off the economy, didn't we? At the beginning of this year, the dates vary as we move around the planet, but in early, early 2020, March the 23rd over here, we went into lockdown and we switched off the economy and that heralded the beginning of the 20s. And so I want to try and understand Try and help you guys. These are just my thoughts. We can debate them later in a bit, hopefully. But let's think about where we're heading. Because decades are interesting. Because you know, you could ask about the, the the 60s and when when did the 60s arrive? And you probably, you know, the 60s didn't arrive till maybe 1963 and the release of I don't know the first Beatles album or something. And the decades tend to shift a little bit around the the, the, the sort of new, numerical borders, but this one didn't. Boom, the 20s arrived. So when we want to ask ourselves if we're going to be in this world of retail and understand it properly, we can ask ourselves what the 20s really means for us all. And so I'm going to start by suggesting that the world's turned upside down. I know we, we even said that, or Gemma said that, briefly in the intro and it's true we just accept it now the world's turned upside down but let me try and illustrate some of that very briefly look the big the big media out there 
the BBC could do it with, I picked CNN. And I checked the figures on this yesterday as I pulled, pulled this thing together. And I was, CNN is still, they've had a boost recently with the whole election thing. They've had a little bit of a lit uplift because we know that, you know, mainstream media has had some tough times and in many ways is in decline. But CNN are getting, still getting 4 million. This is approximate. It's difficult to pin down the figures, but approximately in a little bit of a boom time in the middle of an election, they're getting 4 million viewers a month. That's pretty good. Boom. Joe Rogan, who I was listening to last night and I couldn't sleep. <laughs> Joe Rogan, talk with an epidemiologist or virologist. I listened to it very, we could talk about that tonight and um, later on. Um, 200 million, 200 million downloads. So you want to try and understand where the influencers are coming from. They're not the old ones, are they? It's the death of legacy, like the brands like that. Th things have shifted and literally turned upside down. Let me give you some other examples. In the world of retail, Carlsberg last year, in the middle of all this, they, they sort of rethought, haven't they? Because it's a new environment. They've rethought their position on planet Earth. And they're now suggesting in their new humble mode that they're probably not the best beer or lager in the world. That's quite something, isn't it? You've got this mega brewery actually admitting that mm, maybe we weren't the best. And that is a strategy to take them forward, being a little bit more humble. Mighty brewery being a little bit more humble in the new landscape. And by contrast, one of my favorites, I'm gonna talk about these guys a little bit, but Brewdog. Brewdog, a craft beer company, a craft brewer, only established in 2007. I have to remind myself of that because their whole story, I know you're aware of this in, in, uh, in Australia and elsewhere. By contrast, Brewdog have taken the biggest bloody hoarding you can possibly get in the middle of Piccadilly Circus. And it just says advert, you know, just, in other words, it's ironic, isn't it? So they've entered the mainstream big time, but they're a little bit ironic with it. It's a different landscape now. You couldn't just have them presenting their stuff, like, you know, the best beer, and it just would seem wrong. So I, I'm trying to, pick examples that I think are illustrative of, of where we're heading. More topsy-turvy stuff. I don't know if during lockdown, lockdown one, which is uh, what I'm referring to. This is, I'm in lockdown two. I know it's different for you guys. We could actually discuss the, the, uh, the flavors of the two lockdowns because should we do that briefly? I know I haven't got much time, but the flavors are different because Lockdown one, there was a there was a there was an adventure, adventurous side, a novelty to it. Lockdown two, I tell you what, it's shit. That's what it is. It's really am I allowed to say it's really depressing. We've we've lost that sort of that the fun aspect and sending each other little gifts and messages and learning to bake. That's sort of gone out the window a little bit. Lockdown one, though, look what happened. We had that whole, did you, did you, I was helping to push this, 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 the hashtag celebrity meltdown, hence the title of the presentation. You had celebrities desperate for attention and this awful example of Madonna in the bath as if she was on her own, was clearly being filmed. I mean, the whole thing excruciatingly embarrassing. We've got the queen of pop sort of humbled and uh, in total meltdown. And it, by contrast, again, the new heroes, the, the new stars of the show were the people that pushed through and they're not just the social workers, the health workers, but the, the people who worked in the supermarket, the checkout staff, and we thanked them. So we sort of had new heroes in all this. And I do believe this is part, this isn't insignificant. I think this is part of this reboot that we're going through. So, so understanding the way the planet, the way the planet's changed, but the way our mindset has changed. And if you're gonna to sell to people, if you can, to get right back down to what we're here to discuss, you have to understand the, 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 the new consumer mindset. So new heroes, 
from humble origins. And then I just put this in last night because I wanted to make a point because someone's going to say, what about the change in DTC and direct to customer, direct to consumer? Yes, yes, there has been. We're all been buying online, which has uh, had a massive boost, obviously, since we've been in prison in our bedrooms. But there's, there's winners in that. And the, the winners, like I've chosen one, because I like to choose illustrative examples. And the one I've chosen is Piglet in bed, Piglet, who do pajamas. Why did I show, choose that one? Well, because there wasn't a market before, was there? There wasn't. No one's going to tell me there was a big market in pajamas. There just wasn't. So in other words, this new landscape where things have turned on their heads allowed little brands that just said, you know, we're the ones, you're in the, you're stuck at home, brilliant. We're now doing luxury pajamas, packaged beautifully, delivered to your door. And we'll do slippers and we'll do underwear and a few little bits as well. And they have been printing money in this pandemic. So I think there's an interesting topsy-turvy thing happening there where some of the brands that, you, or some of the product categories that you can't imagine. I mean, walk through a department store, the problems department stores are having recently, but walk through a department store and go to the pajama set, nightwear set. I mean, it's nothing. And it's just polythene bags full of things no one wants. You, maybe once a year you get for Christmas. That whole product has now come to the fore as a special gift and a gift to yourself as well. So I thought it's interesting how new products come to the fore. And then I wanted, these are all challenges to you, by the way, all these things are, are questions to you, whether you agree with me or not. But I wanted to do a little rant about young blood because things will change and they will change. It's very easy, especially well in this, uh, in the middle of this lockdown too that we're in, it'd be very easy to see, oh my God, you know, how are we ever gonna pull back from this? And, and maybe we won't in the UK, maybe we won't. But young blood will, won't it? And uh, just to make the point really clear, if you need me to make it, the thing that we were worried about for 10 years since the last crash, the retail apocalypse, well, it's arrived, hasn't it? And what does it mean? Well, it means rent and rates, which are extortionate, uh, certainly in London and in New York, both places where I you know, know pretty well, that, come crashing down, haven't they? Absolutely crashing down. And the result of that will inevitably mean that new young blood will fertilize that, that area. And we will see that happen. And I want to refer to a little, one of little, my little rants, one of my little pieces, a contentious little piece that I wrote a while ago, which is, man, I hope you understand all this, mankind peaked at me, I wrote, which is, basically trying to explain how it doesn't matter who you are we all think through the ages we all think that we're the peak of mankind we think that mankind peaked at us let me bring it to a local level so in other words i don't really think that i could trust my daughter to sort of do this presentation really because she, she i can't trust her to bring a coffee from one room to the other without spilling it even though she's 27 and all that stuff Yes, yes, but it, you, know, you just don't trust them, do you? Every generation thinks they're handing the bat on to a more feckless, uh, useless, uh, with a shorter concentration span. You know, the younger generation that don't listen, that, 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 that can't be trusted. Every generation, twas ever thus. And every generation believes that. And you can go back and read Samuel Pepys and Dickens, they all, thought the same. They all thought their offspring were just a little bit less, you know, weren't as conscientious, not as hardworking, didn't listen, couldn't take orders as well. You know, all of that lack discipline, we always thought it. And on the other side of mankind, it's like I wouldn't trust my dad to do, bless him, to do this presentation either, really, because he did say something racist or something. Right? And we all think that. That's the amazing thing. Ask your daughter, would she trust you going to the school or what? They, no, they don't. Every generation believes it's the peak of mankind. And it's just worth just making that point because it's clearly not true. Otherwise the, our, the graph of our development would be 
a downward one. And to just prove the point, if you can see this, my little friend, Yayoka, she's, I hope you can see this, she's eight years old. little giggling look to talk to the talk to your children they are learning skills because of god because of youtube they are learning skills that we couldn't even have conceived of you know to ask john bonham from led zeppelin how he learned to drum you know he probably had to go and queue up at the library and get a book out with sort of black and white etchings on it or something and he practiced at home on a, on a, a saucepan and that that the reality now is that super bright kids are learning from all that, learning from all our knowledge and moving at a hell of a rate. So do not underestimate the generation pushing through. If you think they're feckless, you're going to get bitten in the arse pretty hard. So there you go. That's the number one warning. That will happen. Um, have I made myself clear? I think so. So number one, young generation will push through with new and let me illustrate it clearly with new and innovative ways of doing things that we can't even conceive of yet that is clearly going to happen the question for you as retailers and brand owners and all the rest of it is why don't you want to be one of them you know how can you you know get on get into that momentum so that's what i'd say next little rant i wanted to just put a word in for humanity because do you remember what i said about uh robots and all that this is you have to try and understand where where we've been we've been admonished and we've been sent to our rooms humankind has been sent to its room for eight months in our cases we're back in the room okay and that's that's your those are your customers when they approach your store or your restaurant or whatever it is you have to understand that where they're coming from They've been stuck indoors. They've been told off. They're terrified. I call them homo trepidatious. And we have, this is the bad news. I did a bit of good news, young blood pushing through. The bad news is your regular customers, the ones that you've relied on today, are scared. They're terrified. And just like a little child that's been told off and sent to his room, they're feeling very cautious and will feel cautious for a couple of years let's say that let's put it out there okay so now let's take me to this robot issue can you imagine with the rising unemployment levels being that company that says yeah no now we're going to introduce those robots they're going to serve you at the time i mean it's ridiculous i think we can talk about the rise of bots if you like algorithms and that's definitely definitely an issue that we're all going to have to address and in terms of robots, which is what we were always warned, look, here's a little uh, sample I, I dragged together from Der Spiegel. So let's take it out of our culture into uh, Germany. Der Spiegel, look, they were at, at every time here, you could almost do a thesis on this. Every time things looked good, in the mid 60s, in the end of the 80s, 70s, in the mid 2000s, Look what happened. We predicted, we predicted that robots, just in case we got a little bit complacent, we predicted, the media predicted with their, with their uh, desire to scare the shit out of us regularly, they're, they're, they're yearning for catastrophization. They couldn't help it. And every time things got good, when the economy was good, they came along and said, ah, might be good, but the robots are coming to get you. So I think we should, take that all with a pinch of salt and I think any business that's looking to invest in robot robots at a time when we've got incredible levels of unemployment to contend with would be ridiculous and would not be looked upon with any favor so I will say that you know we've been locked in our bedrooms for a matter of months what is it we crave 
we crave humanity, don't we? We crave, it's so obvious. I know we go, oh, we want to open our shops again and open our restaurants again. But what do we really want from those restaurants? We want humanity, don't we? It's really obvious. I know I'm saying it, it's like everyone sitting out there saying, who is this idiot telling us stuff that's so obvious? But please, I see it. I can see that we could miss this point. We need to connect with other humans. And whilst we may have to stay two meters apart and be fully hazmatted up, the fact is we're there because we want to connect with humanity. And I would say as a, as a, as a tip, that's easy and costs nothing. If you were a small retailer, a small shop owner who could not invest in, in new kit or new technology or new design or new branding, invest in your staff and get them to twinkle. That's what I'd say. Because it's not enough just to say, hi, how are you? No, you have to mean it. And if the mask taught us anything, it taught us that we need to twinkle we must twinkle harder than ever before. So it's, an, it's almost that lockdown is a good lesson to us. It's taught us that we must connect. And that's what your customers are ultimately looking for. I've already told you that they've got enough stuff. They've got enough t-shirts. They've got enough shoes to last them a lifetime. They never are allowed to buy another pair. They have enough. So they're in your shoe shop because they want to connect with you, your brand, and get a bit of humanity along the route. So twinkling is my number one tip. See, it's not just about design. Bring it back to me. Can I bring it back to me? So the question is, just going back to this, reach this mindset of the new consumer. This was building up. This has been building up this, this, uh, the fact that we can only consider ourselves. We consider ourselves about, we believe that we're the center of the universe, don't we? Why do we? Because God told us we are. We have the answer to everything in our pockets. So clearly, with God in your pocket, you believe you're the center of the universe. And that is not going anywhere. Despite the fact that COVID's come along, despite the fact we've been sent to our rooms, we still believe we're the center of the universe. So let me take you down another little rabbit hole. Weird, this bloke, isn't he? Who's he talking about? Thomas Malthus. Look, Thomas Malthus, there is, his, there is dates, that's how up to date I am. He believed, basically, he's the guy that started the whole catastrophization of, of the planet in terms of numbers of people, the population explosion, and the fact that we wouldn't, the planet wouldn't be able to feed. This is back in 1766, whatever. He believed that there was, the planet could never feed the, the amount of people that were being born. That's, that's fun. And we still believe that. And I'm, I could challenge that. And I can. I can tell you that I can tell you little things like the fact that if we all lived as densely as they do in Manhattan, or at least they did in Manhattan before they left, we could all fit on to New Zealand. Did you know that? Yeah, check it out. In other words, down here, we believe there's just too many of us. Why am I telling you this? Well, look, look. Let me get, get into this. It's important. It's important for retail to understand this. Listen, if I told you that there are 385,000, which is true, roughly, on average, 385,000 babies are born every day, you just think, well, the planet can't cope with that. There's too many of us. We should have fewer babies. We need to stop that in some way. And that's how we all feel, because we all feel we're going to hell in a handcart, don't we? So we all want to deny the fact that you know too, there's too many people on planet earth too many kids being born until you hypocrites until it becomes your child we're talking about <laughs> then, then it's yours then that's different it's everyone else's we don't want to have don't we there was too many of everyone else's well that obviously it doesn't need, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand the illogicality of that why am I telling you this? Well, because it's the same in retail, isn't it? Let's take luxury goods. Look, luxury, when you get given that Prada, that Louis Vuitton handbag, you feel it's special, don't you? You're the center of the universe. You've saved up for it. It's been a gift. It's the most amazing thing. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful gift. What a wonderful icon. And yet, if I showed you that how many were being made and 
at a video in the factory of these things being churned out, that, that would be different, wouldn't it? You'd suddenly feel that you weren't part of it. You didn't feel that you owned it as much. It's exactly the same. It's this Malthusian concept. There's too much stuff. So why am I telling you that? Well, because we have to understand that the, the mindset that says we, we're special. We want things that are special. And look, the illustrations are all out there. I know that in Sydney, you've just got the new chocolatery. Um, this picture was taken pre, pre COVID, but look, there's a queue of people without masks, but they're queuing up to buy something they could get at the local spa for less than a dollar. There's clearly something else they want here, isn't it? Yes, they can make their own, they can design their own Kit Kat, but no, they want something special because they're the center of the universe. Let me give you a better example. In London, because I'm ranting on too much, in London, there's a brand called Candy Mechanics and they have this machine, you go in, they scan your face and feed it into this machine and the machine carves your head into a chocolate, into a chocolate lollipop of you so that you can suck your own head <laughs> or give it to someone else to suck, it doesn't matter which, but consider that. What sort of an idiot would want his own head made out of chocolate? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Just laughing at myself. If ever proof was needed, we believe we're at the center of the universe. And that means, because I've got to be swift to here, I've got to move on, I'm running out of time. That means you're going to have much more. I'm trying to help you with much more of premiumization and limited editions. You've got to make, I would say that if you're in luxury goods, and I know we've got some luxury good people listening in, I would say you've got to be less inclusive. Difficult things to say, less inclusive. Yes, you've got to be more special, uh, more customized, more bespoke, special limited editions. Let's move on. Another thing I want to tell you about, the new landscape. I believe we're going to have to make new friends. What I mean, a little bit of philanthropy, but new partnerships and collaborations. And maybe if we could link in with social services and maybe we can help young designers and create incubators and have interesting sponsorships. This is the new landscape. We're going to want much more of this collaboration. And I'll flick through some examples just because I can't show you the future. I can only show you what's been there that there's a precedent for the, to the future. But you know, when Supreme linked up with Louis Vuitton, when I love this one, this is Pantone linking with LG TVs. Consider that this is Pantone color system mixing with technology, television screens, and creating a cafe where you've got drinks and stuff that's served in those. I mean, it's kind of genius, isn't it? In other words, what am I telling you here? Throw the logic out the window, turn logic upside down. What did I say at the beginning? This new landscape will demand much more creative thinking, new ways of coming at things, picking something that clearly doesn't fit with another thing and putting it together to make something magical that's where the that's where retail can head and here's another example Dunkin Donuts teaming up with with the uh, home spice candles and doing flavored flavored candles in, in the flavor of their in the smell of their drinks I mean kind of crazy stuff reach out there find something different that's what's really interesting so you know, the question is for all of us what is the currency in the post? We've got everything. So that I, you, I know you've seen me answer this before, but the new currency is obvious, isn't it? It's feel. We've got enough stuff. You can't sell products on their benefits and features anymore. You have to sell them to, in the way that we feel, the way they make you feel. So the question is, moving swiftly along, the question is, what's shops for then? If we don't need any more stuff, what are shops for? It's easy, isn't it? It's really easy. They're feel-good spaces, aren't they? On the whole, they're feel-good spaces, places and spaces that are venues. And this is the new Samsung thing in London. It's a venue. And then Samsung again opened it. This is, you're going to get much more of this. I'm just giving you a little prediction for the future. You're going to get much more of this 
uh, spaces that take you on a little ride. In this case, this is at Westfield in London. They, it was a, a, you know, like a ride, a, a series of rooms you go in to learn about features in inverted commas, but actually it's like a hallucinogenic ride, you know, just to seduce you with the brand, to immerse you completely in the brand. Not a shop with physical things to sell anymore, that's done. There's no use putting posters up with their features and how fast the phone is. Those days are gone. This is much more about taking you taking you in, immersing you. Adidas in Seoul here. I, I chose this example because it's perfect post-COVID, even though it's a pre-COVID thing. It's perfect because it's an exhibition, but it's a single person exhibition. You take, you know, takes you around and gives you the history. Instead of landing in Seoul with a, you know, a brand new training shoe or whatever. No, they tell you the history of Adidas originals in, in terms of like a mobile museum. It's going to be much more of that. So lateral ways of selling, not just conventional ways. And I love this too. This is this is New Balance in last year. Again, all these examples have to be from last year, where they opened up in in London. They opened a pub where you could where you you could turn your credits from your miles that you ran in your New Balance trainers into beer. I mean, kind of lovely stuff. Lovely lateral thinking that gets people talking and that's what it and I want to find it for end on an example because I'm sure you've had enough of me now with going back to that brew dog brand because I love these guys you could they're, they're in the papers every day with something new they're doing and, and I just want to take you back to that advert you remember well yes they did that and they ran the bus adverts too but they recently did this really clever they recently I don't know how many of you knew know that certainly the UK guys will probably know this, but Aldi, who are equally clever, Aldi, the, the, the discount, the, the budget chain of supermarkets, created a copy of the Brewdog Punk IPA. I mean, they didn't call it punk because that would be too obvious. They called it um, anti-establishment, anti-establishment IPA. And Brewdog, a little bit pissed off by this, thought, hang on. Hang on, you can't go taking a piss. It's obvious the colours of the can and everything. We're going to do. We're going to do a Yaldi. We're going to do a beer that looks like you. And they produced this Yaldi beer, and offered to sell it in Aldi stores. This all happened in the Twitter sphere, of course. And the dialogue happened, and of course, it's all good humoured. And it ended up with Aldi taking the Aldi IPA brewed by Brewdog into their store. And it's now their best-selling beer. And now that's the sign of collaboration, isn't it? You know, what, what would have once been, you know, the, a, a, a plagiarism and you could take them to court over it. No, they turn that negative into a positive. And that's what I love about them. The, the other examples are, are many fold. They're in the press yesterday for, I'm allowed to swear on it, but they're in the press yesterday for saying the, the words that's obscured, but fuck CO2 because they're, they're you know, uh, negative carbon, negative now. So all of that stuff that they're always challenging convention. And I say that is the new landscape. You have to, if you're a legacy brand, you have to change. Now is the time to change, really. So Brewdog, yeah, they have their own airline that takes you to their uh, brewery. You know, they, I mean, it's PR, isn't it? Um, and here's their brewery, their dog friendly uh, brewery and hotel in Columbus. And there's the rooms you stay in overlooking the beer being made. And of course they have beer in the shower. Why do they have beer in the shower? Because it's PRable, because everyone talks about the fact that there's a beer in the shower and it costs nothing. And finally, they've just opened in, in uh, Brisbane, haven't they? A big brewery in Brisbane, which I believe opened in July. So a fantastic little brand, a little tiny brand, a, ch a challenger brand that's sort of taking over the planet. And I think that is a, is a marker for the future and I, I truly believe that. So in the summarizing now, gone over my time here, folks, in the post stuff era, these are easy words to say, aren't they? Brands will have to prove how creative they are. That's easy to say. What an obvious thing, but let's be specific. What do I mean by creative? Yes, collaborative. Go back to your stores and look at your competition and Get involved with them. Instead of thinking, oh, what are they up to now? No, get involved with them. 
do something together. Bring that to customers. Show that your friends out there. We've got a new landscape now. Turn logic upside down. Turn those things that you thought were negatives into positives. Be transparent about what you do and all the problems you might have in the post-COVID era. Challenge convention. If you think it's the right way to be doing things, it's probably wrong. Now is the time. Nothing. I would say there's nothing that should just carry on like it regardless. I mean, unless you're the sort of a butcher that's been serving, doing things the way you've been doing since 1898. Do you know, now is the time to change. Be experimental and above all, be stimulating because we were just bored. We got, look, we were hysterical. That's how bored we were. So that's how I'd end. I'd say be stimulating. Thank you for listening. I'm gonna, <laughs> if you, I'm still there, that is, I'm sure there's a couple of you left. If any of you want, I'll just find two, one thing I'll say, if you want to go to any of my, read my stuff, I've done a little link with you on, uh, for you on meltdown.world, that'll take you there and follow me on Twitter because I need the followers. Thank you very much. Gemma, where are you when I need Thank you? you? Thank you, Howard, that was fantastic. Um, <laughs> Yes, it's certainly stimulating and I'm sure we've got lots of people um, itching to ask some questions. Um, but Not I it. might kick off just because, you know, I love talking. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you talk about the idea of, um, you know, it's not about selling stuff anymore, but providing a service and feeling good and um, twinkling, twinkle, twinkle, a little star. Yeah, I talk about a lot of stuff, don't I? <laughs> um, so... If we're not just selling a garment, but we're, you know, showing someone, for example, how to upcycle a garment, um, you know, just like Levi is doing now. Like, why do you think this is important for people now? What's created that shift? Well, because it's, it's, it's back to God, isn't it? We know everything now. We get shown the landfill. We get shown the plant. It's Malthusian again. I'm sorry, it comes back to that, but the catastrophization of it all, we can see the waste. We can see all those babies being born. We can see, we know we're not so stupid now because we all have that device that tells us everything. It's making us hysterical. And as a result, we've got the rise and rise of virtue signaling. I mean, I'm not being negative about it. I'm just being honest. Mm. So you've got brands that, yes, they have to make you feel good. And then they have to make you feel morally good. They have to make you feel like you're a good consumer because clearly consumption that word just that word alone that's a negative thing isn't it on the on the basis that there's climate change and everything is just the word consumption so we're already guilty just being a consumer um yeah i think that answers it pretty directly yeah, you know, so, we, yeah so on that note i guess like do you think um fast fashion will ever cease to exist because you know it gets you thinking doesn't it like does it need to die in order for our planet to survive that's quite existential. <laughs> it is a bit. And you're not going to get me on the cynical. No, do you know what? The planet's going to be fine. But you're now getting me into dangerous territory because I don't want to go down there. The planet's going to be just fine. But the, that's not the point. We're selling to the people that are terrified. We're selling to homo trepidatious. Mm. And we have to make sure they feel reassured, uh, all the rest of it. So, yes, fast fashion is going to plummet off a cliff for those that are that concerned. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got people that are going to be unemployed. And I don't, I know I'm a doomsayer or something, but you know, you cannot switch off the economy for eight months and expect it to bounce back in three. It yeah. will not. Okay. So I can put some dates on it if you want. I like putting my neck on the line. I'm never, never scared of that, but you know, we've got a good couple of years of, of, recession if not the other one the d one you know it's bad okay have you been to new york lately <laughs> it's bad you know fifth avenue's block is is, is uh, boarded up yeah and uh, and uh, and people are fleeing at a great rate this is this doesn't bounce back overnight so things will change dramatically and it, the answer to your question is it's probably binary isn't it there'll always be a place for fast fashion for a specific market, for the more the, for the more affluent market that can care about these things and has the money to care about these things, we will care even more. Yeah, indeed. So, okay, we've actually got some questions from the audience now, which is exciting. So, I've got one from Ian Scott. Um, do you have any thoughts on how legacy brands can make this type of change? 
In my experience, the embedded culture and fear of failure make them reluctant to embrace bold changes. Ian Scott, you say, Ian, oh, you're right. Yeah. It's just fear of change. It's, this is the problem. This is, this is the paradox that, that we're all terrified of change because we're homo trepidatious. We're terrified of everything now. Okay, we're terrified to leave the house. We're wearing a mask. What, what do people want? Have they got it? Have you got it? Have I? We're all terrified, okay? And yet we're more prepared for something new than ever before. And I think the legacy brands, look, we all know who they are, don't we? And I'm not going to list names, but you know those sort of department stores or those mid-market fashion brands that have sort of been around your mum used to shop there and, you know, and they're hanging on, they've got a bit jazzier, didn't they? And they rebranded. They're the, they've got to go. You know, they I've will got go. A drop a name, Howard, drop a name. No, I'm not going to do that. It's really unfair because they're, you know, but it, do you know who they are? They know who they are. But what I would say to them is it's now or never, you know, it's now and you've got to change. But that doesn't, but it's not that difficult. You just try, it's ideas are free. Come up with something and try one, try something, you know, stop all this sort of thing where we've got to roll out and do something. Look how unserious brew dog is just loosen up try something that's i mean honest i know it's easy for stupid me to sit here and it's not easy if you're a big company but now's the time oh boy we're gonna have 2024 is 2024 stroke five is gonna be the roaring 20s there you go i've said it it's gonna bounce back fast will have been the vaccine or whatever will have been far thoroughly distributed We'll, have, we'll have, get, regain our confidence and we're going to be out there buying, spending, eating out, doing stuff bigger than ever before, having been in prison for so long. Prepare for it. Now's the time. Get ready for the new customer. I really believe that. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got a, another question, an interesting one from Bonnie Lane. Um, do you believe a brand focusing on the Gen Y um, is the way of future planning of a brand direction because they are the largest population demographic? No, it depends who you are. I mean, I'm listen, I have to temper everything. We're sitting here about talk. I often get criticized for this, you know, oh, you showed Nike and Samsung. Yes, I'm a butcher, you know, <laughs> back to that. You know, I'm like, what should I do? Well, no, you shouldn't be doing any of that. You should be concentrating. You know, and there's a lovely thing about returning to the past as well. There's a wonderful, yes, you know, when we talk retail in these big terms, these big presentations about, yes, of course, we talk Tokyo and London, Paris, New York, of course. The, the truth is those cities are in trouble now. They're, people have abandoned the cities for a bit and the, and the retail in the suburbs and, uh, and out in the sticks is doing well. And who are they? They're the, they're the little local guys, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick mate. They're doing brilliantly well. And no, they should not be introducing laser shows or, <laughs> or robots at the, at the checkout. No, they shouldn't. So it's a mixed picture. But, you know, I tend to talk to brands in these conversations. And brands are going to have to sort of position for the you know, urban renewal and flagships and all the rest of it. If you're a local store selling shoes, Carry on, be for, twinkle a little harder. Yeah, and, be authentic and be, to your own story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Um, and then, sorry, I'm just looking through all these little questions here online. Um, how do you suggest a company makes the change in direction from being heavily focused on a solution or a product to becoming more feel focused? Well, having ideas having sitting around the table with people that you like get on with and coming up with wacky crazy ideas yeah, uh, me measuring it against people like i showed you know, the brew dogs and the samsung's and go do you know what's clever about the reason i show i don't care about brew dog it's the fact that they take well let's take it to the other one the pantone and lg mm. it's crazy and it's unexpected. Beautiful. I think that's what absolutely unexpected and beautiful, isn't it? Mm. In other words, there are some marriages waiting out there, mm. staring us in the face, 
that we don't think about because we're so locked into convention and looking at sales figures and the footfall and reading the spreadsheets and managing the windows. And do you know what? That all just feels old. It just feels dead. Those are the brands that are dying. I'm being mean now. We've just got. To. So second thing I would say is try something. Try something. Take one of your stores if you've got several and plaster the window up with something and take take people on a different journey. Try something because we're on the whole, I would say, customers are bored. Mm. Mm. And we've got a question here, and um, they've remained anonymous. <laughs> uh, do you think? You. <laughs> do you think that there will be a renaissance of physical experiences and traditional media? Are the younger generation about to give up or move away from the social world, or do we need to find the middle ground? It's quite interesting, actually, from a social media. I don't understand the middle ground thing, but of course they're not going to give up. No. We're, humans are a social species. Listen, if, there, if we were talking 300 years time, maybe, no, even then, do you know what? 2000 years ago, I'm not sure I'm answering the question. I'm not a politician. 2000 years ago, we wandered down to the forum with a sheep wrapped around us. You know, we we're Roman or whatever. And we looked at stuff in the, in the center of town. We didn't need anything, but we wandered down there and we picked up a candle and sniffed it and, and <laughs> You know, we tried a few things and we stopped for a coffee or a glass of wine or whatever, met a friend, met your mother, your brother and a business colleague and wandered back. And in 2000 years time, we'll be doing the same. We really will. The, what we'll be picking up and sniffing, I don't know what, but you know what, it's very basic stuff. And I think that's fundamental. We come to town because we need to connect with humans. We're a social species. And I think anyone who suggests we're not, you, you know, the, I always try and think of the opposite argument. You know, you've got to stand up and make a really good argument to say that we've evolved out of human contact. And it's just not true. And I'd say post lockdowns, plural, as I said in my little rant, you know, we're, we're absolutely desperate for humanity again. We're absolutely starved of it and we're going to find it and the brands that give it to us will succeed and that's an easy thing to say but it's true mm. no absolutely let's start to wrap it up if anyone's got any um last questions to come you've through milked me, Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> sorry you've milked me <laughs> <laughs> and you only just started your day and um it's absolutely you know it's so kind of you to wake up I've, I've, I'd like to say I've enjoyed it. I have sort of enjoyed it. It's great for me to get back into presenting again. Absolutely. You know, I love it. I love it. But it's a bit, I have to say it's weird. If I ever came, if I came across slightly weirdy, it's because there's no audience. There's no feedback. There's nothing. <laughs> I can't even see anything. So, you know, forgive yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm sure there's been a lot of getting used to it. <laughs> I'm sure there's been a lot of laughter and um, energised discussions in, um, in rooms with clients and things. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I just want to obviously um, reiterate as well to the audience, thank you so much for, for coming and um, spending some time with us this evening in our Be Inspired series. And with Howard, um, we couldn't have had a better first speaker for this. So um, it's been such a pleasure, Howard, thank you. Thank and you, thanks guys. For, I, I will say thank you to everyone who bothered to, to listen. And I know it's not easy, thank you. And special thanks to Dashing for setting it up. They've done a great job. Thank you. Thanks so much. And um, yeah, I just want to reiterate, um, Howard's Twitter is at Retail Futurist. Yes. And, yes. <laughs> um, some very, uh, very interesting insights on a daily basis on that. And um, his blog is also really interesting, if you happen to know it. It's 22and5.com. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Appreciate it.